Good evening. Welcome to the Piccadillo Sofa Club. I'm Alexis Gregory. I'm your host for the evening. And tonight we will be discussing the acclaimed feature film 1985, written and directed by Yen Tan. Now, hopefully you've had a chance to watch the film either earlier this evening or maybe you've seen the film previously. Or uh, if you haven't seen the film, perhaps after our discussion this evening with uh, Yen and Corey Michael Smith, the actor who plays Adrian, and with Hutch, the story producer, cinematographer and editor. Uh, perhaps you'll be inspired to watch the film. We will be discussing it in detail, so please forgive any spoilers. But let's bring on our guests. Um, please welcome Yen, Corey and Hutch. Hi. Hi, guys. Hey. Hello. Thank you all for being here. Where are you all this this evening? It's this evening in the UK. Where are you? Where are you coming in from? I'm in Austin, Texas. I'm in Dallas, Texas. And I'm in New York City. Right. Thanks for being here, and congratulations to all of you on 1985. It's a really beautiful, really touching film. Thank you. Thank you. So let's get stuck straight in and share a trailer for the film, and then we'll come back and we'll chat some more. Christmas wasn't the same without you. I'm really glad you made it back this year. I want to apologize to you for, uh, you know, being able to come to New York to visit me. I know you were really bummed about that. <laughs> you left home just as soon as you could. You couldn't have left any faster. You don't even talk to your own family anymore. So stop telling me what I should do. I spoke with Carly, and I think she's still on the market. So then why did you call me today? Why are we doing this? I just want to see you one last time. I've lost so many friends. Dear father, we want to thank you for allowing us to spend this Christmas together. We pray that there are many more days like this to come, many more memories for us to look forward to. We pray that you'll continue to teach us how to love each other unconditionally, just the way that you love us. We pray that your everlasting grace continues to lead and inspire us. It's a really beautiful trailer for a really um, beautiful film. Uh, watching it, I found it so moving and so effective, affecting, and there were um, so many things to discuss that I feel the movie brings up. So I'm sure we'll have a great chat this evening. If anyone's watching at home and they have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the comment section on whatever platform you're watching on. Yen, if I may start with you, just in case anyone hasn't watched the film, can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about what it's actually about? Yeah. Um, so 1985 is about a young man played by Corey Michael Smith who returns home to Texas from New York uh, for Christmas and he struggles to review a dire truth revolving around his AIDS diagnosis to his uh, very conservative family. Yeah, and he's also in the closet in terms of him himself being gay as well. So there's like right. this, this double-edged return to the closet for Christmas. Yeah. Um, exactly. And, yeah. Uh, and I, I know you worked on the story with Hutch, so I'm assuming that means coming up with the, the bare bones of the story uh, and then formulating the screenplay. Um, so, Hutch, what inspired this film? Why did you guys decide to tell this very personal story? 
Well, first I'd like to start off with you mentioning the trailer because uh, what a lot of people don't know is Yen actually cut that trailer. Um, right. That is that is 100% Yen, Yen's edit. Um, I had a few notes here and there, but he actually... We, we were struggling with the trailer for a while, and then he watched a bunch of trailers. And I think I think I cracked it, and then uh, we ended up with yeah, a very powerful uh, trailer that still like gets me in the gut every time I watch it. Um, but honestly, uh, you know, Yen and I did the short, and he wrote the short film, and that was based on some personal experiences, which I'm sure he'll he'll talk about um, here in a little bit. But uh, I, I want to say we were mostly through post on the short and uh he emailed uh me about uh he said i think I've, there's more to this story that i want to tell and he said you know give me a few weeks i'm gonna write an outline and and uh and then i'll send it to you and you know we can figure out if there's something here so a few weeks pass and he sends me the outline and uh we just it's kind of just started a conversation and yen did the first i don't know four or five drafts and then um then i just i we started having more communication about the uh like what it was like uh living in like texas in the 80s because yen wasn't living in texas in the 80s and so i was growing up around that time and actually the 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 dance club that uh features in the film is inspired by uh a really famous uh dance club in dallas in the 80s called the start club which was kind of like dallas's studio 54 for the mid to late 80s um and so my dad bartended there and i was like one of the few kids allowed in that bar so i kind of knew that scene a little bit so i i kind of brought like some of that of uh, my life experiences and kind of shared that with yen who then kind of wove that into the um into the screenplay as far as that but um yeah it's very much a labor of love i mean it's it's really mostly yen and just me kind of like giving some some interesting counterpoints to what he was uh, he was putting into the script right uh, what i'd love to discuss a bit later on is the intimacy of the film because um it really does feel like we intrude on this family over the christmas holidays i'd, I'd love to have a bit of a chat about that later yeah but I can just ask you corey uh, congratulations on the performance the central role of adrian it's a really beautiful performance Thank you. and it's so subtle and it brings the audience in what were your initial thoughts and feelings on receiving the script and what were your thoughts on on the character as well uh the the script is gorgeous i mean the first time i read it i was pretty immediately emotionally connected to adrian and his crisis and conflict the thing that stuck out to me uh you know beyond the words that are being said is the relationship of a family that is so close in proximity, but there's so much space between them emotionally and spiritually. You know, this family that wants to be together and there is undeniably love there, but there's a really palpable disconnect. Um, people sort of sharing space, but not sharing truth. And I, I found it to be such a wise and heartbreaking observation of an American family um, and certainly one that I sort of understand, uh, you know, people that, that aren't great at communicating with each other. Um, and so I was so drawn by the life and the secrets underneath the, the script and the pleasantries of this family, everything that's not being said, it just felt so rich and so open. And that's why I was really drawn to this. I thought what Yen crafted was unbelievable. Mm. It's really interesting when you talk about them communicating. I noticed there's a lot of exchanging of gifts and expensive oh. gifts and even exchanging of pies and roasted chickens um, from the uh, old school friend. And I noticed there's characters, they're sharing these material things, but they're really finding it hard to connect, like you say. Um, yeah. what, Corey, what, are there any similarities between you and Adrian? And is there any, any parts of him that are so different from you that you had to really try and get your head around to, to, to deliver that performance? I mean, there's there's a massive difference in us in that what he's gone through losing multiple friends weekly uh, is something I've I've never experienced, obviously, mm -hmm. and I, I hope I never do. Um, 
but that's a it's an incredible way to have this entire life and experience in New York City. You know that is so significant in the way that it constructs your personhood and your uh, experience of life, and then to go home to your family and not to be able to share this experience and this trauma with them. Um, I found that to be uh, tr so heartbreaking, and so a lot of the work that I was doing was um, there's a there's a really wonderful Instagram page called the AIDS Memorial. Yes. And they, they take uh, photos or people can submit stories and, and photos of loved ones or friends. And it's sort of this online quilt of people who have um, passed uh, because of AIDS and it shows pictures of them and tells their story from their friends and family. And, uh, you know, it's an incredible it's an incredible uh, memorial for these folks, but I spent a lot of time sort of crafting, you know, the idea of like an entire community of friends that's being decimated. Mm. So that's yeah, it, it is an incredible page and it's so moving that page on Instagram and you hear all about these stories and people's memories. So if, uh, if anyone hasn't checked it out, it's the AIDS Memorial on Instagram. I'd love to look at another clip from the film, which is uh, when Adrian is in the kitchen and there's a little accident, which we're going to see. And it's the moment where, um, the, the re very real kind of isolated threat of HIV and AIDS is suddenly brought into the home. Let's have a look. Ow! Oh, ah. oh, did you cut yourself? You didn't have nowhere to bend is. Why don't you let me help you? I'm fine, Mom. I'm not a child. I found that scene really interesting. As I said, one of the first times that um, suddenly the threat is in the house, this, this unspoken threat that hangs through the movie a lot. Is Yen there? I've got a question for Yen. I think he's having a technical issue. Oh, I think they're trying okay. to work it out. <laughs> okay, Hutch, maybe maybe you could help me with this one. Okay. Um, I mentioned earlier, the um, it feels like we're, we're really observing this family. Um, and I wondered why there was the choice to create this film such an intimate surrounding um often when we think of aids movies they're big they're epic they're about activism they're about friends being um, friendship groups being decimated losing lovers um remembering people they're always so big and epic which is amazing but you have all created a very intimate structure for this story and why did you make that choice to make it so personal well, I mean, that, that really comes a lot from Yen. Uh, I mean, that's uh, his style is very intimate. All of his films are extremely intimate. And we talked a lot about that. Um, and, you know, you mentioned earlier about just kind of uh, kind of the cameras like a voyeur through this family. And, you know, we made a conscious effort to do lots of like dolly shots through hallways. And so you're always kind of peering through. And it's it's also that kind of idea of going from one room to the next and like what are people hearing what are they not hearing what is it's we're trying to give the audience the same feeling that these characters are kind of going through where things are always kind of hidden until they're revealed and so there's lots of like kind of slow pushes in and that's why we have a lot of things where the you know the camera comes in through the door crack like when uh Corey's character is talking to um to Jamie's character uh, on the over the phone like we just kind of like a 
dolly down the hallway without any characters you just kind of hear it and then you just kind of peer through and you get the last part of that conversation so it was all just about trying to slowly seep into these characters and so that's kind of the camera moves kind of mimic that as well and um i think yen yen can kind of expand upon that as well hi yen welcome back um yeah we were just chatting about the choice to make such an intimate movie about a family um with this kind of imminent threat of HIV and AIDS. Um, I wondered what, what, Yen, what kind of films influenced you, either queer films or other films that explore the virus in, the, in, in your own work? Um, I would say, I mean, I think, I think it wasn't really specifically AIDS or queer film and, you know, there, there wasn't any specific films, you know, I think that was definitely one film, um, an early frost that came out in 1985, which was like a t television movie that was a film that was also about a homecoming, a character homecoming and a character coming out and reviewing his diagnosis to his family uh, that we're thinking about in the back of our minds and trying to figure out if, if we were to tell a, so a similar story today, how can we tell it differently, you know, and so so in, in, in the case of 1985, we thought we could do it in a way where we don't have to mention the word gay or AIDS and you watch it and you know exactly what's happening, you know, sort of thing. Um, I would say, oh, actually, Parting Glances is a film that we kind of thought about or we kind of sort of watch um, uh, as part of our research um, and to sort of help us inform sort of this idea of using the black and white aesthetic, you know, we were, we were definitely like watching films that where where black and white was used and you know it's it's it's, it's essentially used in like contemporary films you know whether it's um something like Francis Ha or even uh, Ida and um the the there was one film that we looked at specifically that was made in the early eighties by Ken Loach called Looks and Smiles that was also shot in black and white uh, and also the Control the film about Ian Curtis and Joy with Division that we we sort of looked at as references as well. And why did you make the choice specifically to use black and white for 1985? I think it was a combination of just but budget wise, you know, we we were sort of restri restricted in terms of how much we can dress the world, right? Mm -hmm. Shooting in modern day, basically. And we know we we're going to be in s certain kind of settings where we cannot control what the background looks like, like airports and, and nightclubs and so forth. And so we, we thought black and white was a way to sort of like diffuse a lot of that sort of production design elements where you're not thinking in terms of like, oh, this is like modern day. Um, but it was also very useful in that it sort of forces you to look at the characters as a focal point. And, and we know we were just telling stories about people and we wanted, we wanted people to sort of like pay attention to the characters, not, not to what's happening in the background. Well, and, and to add to that, like the, I think a lot of the the most powerful like photography from that era about the epidemic were black and white photos. Mm -hmm. We just kept kind of seeing these photos that were just the the most like gut wrenching, and just kind of that kind of I think also kind of filtered onto that as well. Yeah, sure. There are those really famous pictures of young men really ill in bed. So I absolutely understand what you mean. Those pictures almost look kind of cinematic as mm -hmm. cinematic as they are. Talking about the intimacy of the relationships, uh, Corey, I noticed that your character has a different relationship with every single character in the film. And we, he almost reveals or doesn't reveal different parts of himself to each different character. How was that to play and work on these different dynamics with the different actors and the different characters they play? Uh, well, a lot of that is is just beautifully baked into the script. So, you know, how much how much Adrian uh, reveals or wants to reveal to different people sort of is calibrated per person. But then also the the cast was filled with very uh, very different human beings, and sometimes it's great as an actor to just be surrounded by very different people because some of that can just naturally sort of influence. Um, uh, occasionally in the wrong way, so you adjust. But uh, you know, sometimes you have a deeper connection with other people than than others. Um, but I also, you know, there there were some really beautiful surprises. One of the early scenes we shot was um, with Virginia and I in the car at the end of the film, and um, you know, Virginia is is uh, a remarkable actress, and she and I both showed up like ready to do this scene um, and sort of very 
naturally full of um, emotion. And so when we did that scene together, um, I think there was a, a mutual sort of appreciation for each other's craft and preparation for that. And that sort of set a tone, I think, for our personal connection for the rest of the shoot. Um, so there are also some wonderful things that just sort of happen in the making of the thing that adjust one's friendship or connection. And sometimes you just embrace those things and lean into them. That's such a beautiful scene that you mentioned with Virginia, who plays your mother. It's so moving. And um, we'll absolutely talk about that scene. I would love to chat some more about it. I found it so um, emotional. We're going to have a look now at another scene, which is with Adrian and his father. So still on the subject of the family relationships. Yeah. And this is a scene that comes around three fifths of the way through the movie. There's been a big gulf between Adrian and his dad throughout, really struggling to communicate. And then um, this happens. So let's have a look. I can't, honest, I'm with you. I gotta go to bed. You remember when I was in Connecticut for Frank's funeral? He was the commander of my platoon, you remember? Well, they thought he killed himself. <laughs> Knowing him, he just probably just got too wasted. Was fooling around in some shooting range that he shouldn't have been on. Stupid son of a bitch. So I was in Connecticut for Frank, and then I took the train down to the city to have lunch with you. Yeah. I asked if I could see your place, but you had excuses as to why that wasn't a good idea. Dad, it's I just didn't want you to see what a mess it was if I had had time to clean it. Why are you still bullshitting me? I took a cab to your neighborhood. I wanted to see where you lived. As we drove past your building, I thought I saw you with some guy on the steps, but I, I wasn't sure at first if it was you, so I had the cab driver go around the block again. And this time, I, I was sure it was you. You had your arms around him. I didn't even recognize you. It was like you were a different person. you even think about telling your mother. You will break her heart. You hear me? Not one word. Yes, sir. It's such a beautiful scene. It's really painful, but it's so well written and so well acted. And um, this is the point where we as the viewer realize the father knows that his son is gay throughout the whole film. I, I did say if you're tuning in, there will be spoilers. I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, and then he has the added guilt, of course, put on him of don't tell your mother. Um, there's a whole um, uh, weight from religion that hangs over this film and the religious characters and the way that they are battling with their faith. Yen, why did you choose to explore religion in the film in this way and use it to kind of create the conflict? Um, so, you know, I was I was born and raised in Malaysia and I think I think that there's definitely a, 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 a there's, there's a traditional part of my upbringing that is very much the sort of like the, the being the closet experience is something that 
you know that that I that I went through you know for a long time and I think even to this day there are few aspects of my life that really has to be remain closeted when I when I go back home to Malaysia to visit and stuff and so so this element of like being closeted because of cultural or, or tradition is something that that is very personal to me and I think having been in Texas lived in Texas for so many years like there's something about Christianity in Texas that for me kind of there's there's a lot of overlap I feel like with with, with what I've what I've what I've gone through and 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 they are like very similar to my upbringing and 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 in that sense like it, it remains something that I'm, I'm I'm very fascinated by I sort of like have a lot of Christian friends in Texas and I sort of see how they sort of you know how how they experience their lives and so forth you know and then people who are gay and 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 how they also in some ways um keep aspects of their lives um secret from from their family and stuff and i and i i just thought those were just like really really um rich rich sort of territories to sort of like explore for this film mm, it is so rich and i think any queer person watching understands the um the duality of those lives coming together when we find out that the dad has been outside Adrian's home and seen him and Adrian's previously kept his his home life separate he wouldn't let his little brother come to New York and visit um so there's a real interesting clash of the, the queer world and the straight world in in this film and and for Corey's character as well I really notice um I wondered what was that kind of pull like for you to play Corey the character who's trying to come out trying to maybe be clear about his diagnosis and living under this kind of pressure, this pressure cooker environment. How, how, how did you bring that to life so effectively? I mean, the, the conflict really is the, the desire and the want to be honest, to say goodbye, um, especially to a younger brother who has, um, uh, you know, who's sort of this awkward, kid in the middle of development and you want to give him a solid foundation and hope and confidence in the future. But I think religion is really important in this film in that it is, and it still plays this role to, to a significant degree in culture, but it is the installation of, of guilt and fear that forces this repression. Uh, it stands in the way of people being able to connect to each other honestly um you know it it hands people the weapon of judgment uh that the book itself says is not yours to to wield and yet people do um it's it's a it's a powerful force in society and it is the thing that adrian believes is keeps his family from understanding, appreciating, or loving him. And so to stay away from that territory is really the only way to be able to express his love through these gifts and his words and his presence without crossing this line that could ruin their relationship um, because of this belief system that they have. Mm. It's so complex how it's presented in the film as well. There's so many surprises. We, we sometimes see a sudden tenderness um, from the father towards his son. We see the mum turning off the religious radio program she doesn't want to hear anymore. So there's so many of these characters I feel are in conflict. It's really interesting. And it, it really does make make for that, that richness. Um, let's talk a little bit about the brother that we'll chat a bit about later on. Um, I thought it was a really interesting character. Yen or Hutch, can you tell us where the idea for the brother came from? Um, I would say... I mean, I think, you know, I I have I, I have an older brother that I was really close to growing up, you know, and and even though he's 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 not gay, you know, I, I I look up to him as 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 a younger brother did, you know, growing up, and I I think he definitely had, he was a very impressionable figure for me growing up, you know, and so uh, it, it's a combination of trying to depict that sort of brotherly sort of relationship and also and also using using 1985 as a way to sort of go back in time and tell myself that being gay is doesn't have to be this horrific sort of experience you know it could be something that is beautiful and complete by itself that is not um weighed down by the baggage of the epidemic you know which is something that very much was 
weighing heavily on me growing up as a kid in the 80s where there was this sense that that if you if you were gay you were gonna die of AIDS you know and you're gonna just have this really sad life and so I I felt like it was a way for me to sort of explore that and sort of like a way to sort of go back in time and tell myself that you know this is like there's a distinction between these two things and that and then being gay doesn't have to be like this mm. as well as the virus do you feel that um, exploring religion in the film kind of doubles that that idea of you're going to be lonely, you're going to have an unhappy life? It, it was another layer to add that that kind of yeah. thought in. Yeah, definitely. We we also talked a lot about just kind of um, generational, like just kind of family and how uh, things change from generation to generation. It was just I think you know I also talked about how going from the parents to Corey's character and then the younger, you know, brother. And just like, we like that kind of like showing the, the ebbs and tides of like what, how this affects different generations and, mm -hmm. and how we could show that in an interesting way. That's like, okay, it's like each, each section has its own kind of like, you know, battles that it deals with, with this within the same context. And it was interesting to show that with the different age as well. Um, that was just something that Ian and I really discussed quite a bit when, when kind yeah. of putting the whole thing together. Absolutely. I think the representation of the brother was also very important in that we had to have some sort of representation that things were going to get better. You know, I mean, we're, we're sort of like spending time in this really bleak area in this bleak, bleak world. And, 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 and the younger brother character was kind of like a representation of like, you know, it's not going to be like that for him, you know, compared to, compared to um, Aiden. I mean, compared to um, Adrian, sorry. Yeah, there's lots to discuss, I think, about what might happen in the future with the, and um, the generational gap you, you mentioned, Hutch, is really interesting also with the parents, of course, and the battle they're having. We, we, we'll have a bit more of a chat about um, the relationship between Adrian, played by Corey, and Andrew, his brother, in a moment. But we're just going to have a quick look at a trailer for an upcoming film from Piccadillo. It's Mignon and... Uh, We'll be back, the four of us, shortly. Where have you been? I get call from school, then from your father. What happened to you? Got ID? Come on, can't you see the boy needs a drink? To make the minion here, I need two men. You don't understand. What's so hard to understand? You crash here for a while. He is handsome, I will give you that. Travel your road and tell the truth, but know whence it came. Hi everyone, welcome back. So that was Minyan. We are discussing 1985. I'm here with Yen Tan, Hutch and Corey Michael Smith. And we're going to look at another clip from the film now. This is uh, a really beautiful moment between Adrian, Corey's character and his younger brother, Andrew. Let's have a look. Hey, um, I wanna apologize to you for uh you not being able to come to New York to visit me. I know you were really bummed about that. I just, something came up and I couldn't get any time off, so. Hey, what are you listening to nowadays? Is that Madonna? So when are you into Madonna? Hey, I, um, I was at her last show at Radio City Music Hall. Wait, you went to the Virgin tour? Yeah, Leo got us front row tickets. No way. Yeah, it was so much fun, man. We had such a blast. I, uh, had her other album too. Dad found it in my backpack and threw it away. Really? He's thrown away a bunch of tapes. I had a Brian Adams poster, but he tore it off the wall. There was a sermon at church about secular uh, music. That's nothing new, Andrew. 
I always find ways to make that stuff up. Yeah, well, people around here don't think it's made up. You know, Mr. Thompson from down the road? Yeah? He has all the records. Oh, yeah. He has an amazing collection. He had an amazing collection. He had Pastor John over, and they burned them all in his backyard. You could see the smoke from blocks away. The fire department had to come and put it out. Do you think I'm ugly? I mean, like, if you weren't my brother and all. Andrew, why would you ask that? Well, I don't know. The kids at school, they, um, they call me Pizza Face. Tommy Clemens said that his sister said that there's no way we're related because you're so much better looking than me. You're not ugly, okay? I had really bad skin too. It goes away after a few years. Kids can just be assholes. Also, Tommy's older sister, Susie, was such a bitch and no one liked her because she tried way too hard to be cool, so he's probably the same. You just said the A word. Um, it's a great scene there between you two. I love that relationship between younger brother, Andrew and Aiden. And as a lifelong Madonna fan, I'm so pleased that she is the signifier that brings them together. We realize it's a young gay boy in training when he has his Madonna cassette. Um, I think if the family are upset with Madonna now, they're not gonna cope with erotica sex book era, are they? <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> uh, Corey, what are your thoughts on that relationship and uh, literally taking on the older brother role? Uh, well, it came very naturally. I love Aiden. Aiden and I have stayed in touch. We're still friends. I, I've become friends with his family. Um, I text semi-regularly with his mom. So I, it was a very natural uh, brotherly relationship that has sort of continued to this day. And he's... He's a bit older than I think he looks in the film. I mean, in, in real life, I think he was like 15, 16. Um, and going through his own personal changes and revelations. And he's a really special, very funny uh, young man. And so I enjoyed spending time with him. And um, and it was, you know, all these like, it's it's written that it's, it's really the, the closest relationship in in the film and i think he he feels such an adoration for his young brother and and really truly guilty that like he he can't play the role of older brother like he would like to and bring him to new york because he'd be bringing him into a whole other world that he doesn't know how to explain and feels like he needs to protect his little brother from um and i i think the script and yen you know it, it really makes, a, he makes a really uh, precious relationship, how they're getting to know each other. And by the time they leave, the real tragedy is that like this, this brotherhood could actually be something really special, but it's, it's, um, it's sort of stolen from them by circumstance. Yeah, it's really a beautiful relationship, the way it develops. If anyone hasn't seen the film, then the boys are, there's a bit of a distance between the boys at first, not through um, Adrian's want of trying, but uh, Andrew, the little boy's a bit shy at first, isn't he? And a little bit frosty, feels a bit let down, but they yeah. reform this relationship. There's that really sad line as well, uh, Corey, where your character says to his female friend, Carly, make sure they tell him what happened to me. So we assume that when the inevitable unfortunately happens to your character, that perhaps a story will be made up to explain it. Uh, it's really sad. Um, I'd wondered, uh, yeah, and do we, do we feel that uh, Adrian, Corey's character, is perhaps a father figure to the younger brother, and kind of older gay mentor, um, perhaps pr providing guidance where the, the real father can't? I mean, I, I didn't know for sure. Like, I think, I think that's, that's definitely, um, th that's the intention of the character, you know? And I think that it was also another way for me to sort of express this idea that, that, it, it's it's also a representation of a whole generation of of gay men who 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 died who we lost, and they were 
they were potentially our, our mentors and father figures too. You know, I mean, that was like a, I, I feel like we, we were deprived of that, of just that whole generation of people who could have sort of guided us through, you know, and, 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 and we could learn from them, you know. It's a massive thing, isn't it? So many older gay men say that's when the generational conversations between generations stopped and that they never really formed again. And um, we, we lost so many older mentor figures. That's why it's so beautiful to see it from, from the older brother to the younger. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and I wondered what would happen, do we think, if the brother, little brother tried to come out maybe 10 years down the line after whatever happened with Adrian, do we think it would be possible? I mean, absolutely. I think I think he'll he'll have a much easier time, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think yes, <laughs> easier than 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 his older brother for sure. But right. we, you know, we we actually had, had tossed around an idea that we haven't even talked about in forever about like revisiting um, ten years later and doing nineteen ninety five and exploring. Um, some of that stuff, um, but I won't get into much of that. But yeah, it, it's it, it. Yeah, maybe you should. Do it. You could bring Corey back in a flashback sequence. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know. I think it's doable. Well, well, yeah, it's, don't well, it's, actually, it's actually interesting because Yen sent me an article like I want to say a few years after a year or two after we wrapped, and it was dealing with actual people that were in similar situations to Corey's character who didn't die and who spent all of their money because they thought they were going to and then how like kind of miserable their lives were like trying to like either homeless or just like just really struggling and you know that was also something too that we you know it was just kind of another fascinating um thing to like left turn to take um as far as the characters and story goes so i mean it could it could go either way honestly depending on whether or not you know he survived or he didn't like mm. where he would be if he did survive it's very interesting very i've heard about those stories as well sorry yen what was that oh no no i wasn't saying anything i was just oh. i was just um, nodding <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was Corey and I misheard it. Um, yeah, we do. and it, it's also when there's such optimism from Carly when she says to um, to Adrian, maybe they'll find a cure in a year. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah, that didn't really happen. Um, we're going to have a look at another section from the film. This is the uh, montage sec section, which comes up towards the end of the film, where um, uh, Adrian's returned home and we see how life goes on for the other characters, including him. Let's have a look.
So really moving into the film, I feel like it's a series of private moments and we see different aspects of all of the characters. Uh, Yen, what's the significance of the kiss at the end? Is it a moment of defiance for Corey's character? Is it that we see him on his home turf where he can be himself again? What's the thinking? I mean, I think the... I, I remember the intention was that it needed it needed to end on a note of optimism, right? After what we have seen, which is like this sort of like beat down. And I think it needs to end on a note of, and the ironic thing is that it ends on a flash flashback when, 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 when the character is at his happiest moment of meeting someone he was going to fall in love with and experiencing that kiss. And it's a flashback, but it's also mean to signify the future in a way, you know, mm -hmm. where it's like, because this is this is where we're what what we're, we're living in a completely different time right now. When as as far as sort of like you know being gay and liberation and all this kind of stuff and equality. And I think I think ending it on that note was a way to sort of say, yeah, this is actually where we're at. Right. And uh, Corey, what do you think happens to your character Aiden moving forward? Do we think he does get to survive? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Up to the I don't, I don't, maybe. I, uh, <clears throat> I if you hesitate. want a sequel, Corey, you should say yes. <laughs> I hesitate positing that answer for anyone. I, I like to, I didn't leave that up to the viewers and for right. uh, yeah, I'm the screenwriter to, to decide that. <laughs> we said you can come back in a flashback sequence if there is a, se a sequel anyway. So, yeah. yeah. I do want to point out something, Alexis, if you don't mind, um, because Please. I want to I want to add a sort of commentary to this conversation. That is, that 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 that's something that I, that I that I know this, and maybe Corey can speak of this too. I feel like a lot of people are watching 1985 in the past couple of years since the pandemic, and it, they're watching it with a sort of like different appreciation, if that makes sense, you know. And I think I think there's something about what we went through in 2020 and 2021 where this movie is sort of like even the movie it's, it speaks to me on a in a different way now when i when i revisit it you know and it's kind of like oh wow like we, just, we we went through something really substantial and it's kind of like some some interesting overlaps in terms of what we went through and what was exploring the film absolutely even on a smaller scale perhaps with the recent monkeypox scares that we've had and yeah. how kind of triggering that is for a lot of gay men this idea of sexuality mixed with an illness as well i guess on that theme, Yen, what, what do you want the viewers to feel when they watch this film and they, they go on the journey with the family and, and, and Adrian? What, what do you hope is one of the possible takeaways for them? Um, I, I think it still goes back to the thing that, that, that you know, the, 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 the message that Adrian leaves in the, in, in, in the tape for his brother, where, um, you know, uh, things get Wait, I'm blanking on <laughs> right now. What is it? What's the line? Um, Which, does he say they'll get harder before they get easier? Right, right. It's harder before easier, but the way it's said in the film is of brighter. Mm -hmm. Things get things get oh, brighter. Right. Things get darker before they get brighter. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that line is 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 something that I I keep going back to from <laughs> time to time, and I've sort of gone back to it in the past few years when when we were sort of in lockdown and things just felt really, mm. I don't know, just like horrible depressing. and depressing and just repetitive i guess and uh, and i think I, I go back to that line you know and i was always thinking in terms of that and it's like i think that line has ultimately has a it it it, 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 it kind of resonates because i think it's a line that we can always come back to i'm really glad you actually mentioned that sequence because i think it's such an amazing way for the film to finish and um Corey, would you mind just explaining to anyone who's watching, perhaps who hasn't seen the film, what the sequence is that we're talking about when you leave that message for your your brother? Yeah. So w when uh, when Adrian goes to the air before Adrian goes to the airport, he leaves a uh, <clears throat> he leaves a cassette tape in in Aiden's bedroom, and so Aiden listens to this cassette um, in the very Walkman where he was listening to Donna and. Uh, and it's a it's a message from his older brother um, just saying that he sees him, he understands him and offering some advice that may not make sense to him right now. But to keep this cassette and listen to it whenever you need it, just saying, 
you know, you may feel alone or you may feel unlike other people. Um, but there are so many people out there just like you and there is a community for you and you may have to leave home to find that. And it may be scary and it may be hard to leave family, but you will find a community where you feel a part of something um, and where you can be happy and feel seen. Um, and that, that sentiment to the younger brother, knowing that he's never going to be able to say this to Aiden at a point when Aiden maybe fully understands what he's saying. But the message is clear enough. And as he grows older and listens to it over and over again, <clears throat> you know, it's like the blur will go away from the message and, and he'll understand exactly what he's saying. It's a really beautiful moment in the film. And... Um... Uh, it's really powerful. I think it's something that's really hard to get right. It could possibly not work, but it's so well written and it, the voiceover is so well delivered by you, Corey. It's such a beautiful way to end the film with this sense of hope. And um, it almost feels like perhaps even it's, uh, it's a letter to yourself, you know, to your younger queer self, as well as to this younger sibling. Um, but it, it's such a powerful moment and uplifting, but painful and at the same time. Um, we're going to move on to some questions that have been coming through. So okay. if you guys don't mind, I will hit you up with some questions. This one, I think, is probably for uh, Yen and Hutch. It's a question from James. The music seems very minimal, but so haunting. This is the music in the film, of course. Who was the composer, and what were the conversations around the composition? I think we can tackle that one together, Hutch. Yeah. I'll start off by saying that uh, Curtis Heath is a is a good friend of ours who um, who um, who's kind of like done the score for my previous films, um, and I think w one of one of the things that was kind of like a, 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 a sort of like a reference uh, that that we we bounce off um, Curtis is kind of like um, sort of like that sort of very. 80s John Barry sort of score cues and and we were like pulling from like Adrian Lyne movies and stuff too and we we're just kind of like making him listen to those cues you know from like films like Indecent Proposal to Fatal Attraction and stuff because we kind of like that sort of it, it feels very 80s but it also feels very sort of like emotional like emo that's like a very emotional richness to it that, that I really respond to that I thought was right for our film, you know, and and I think I think that was kind of like where 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 how you know how the initial score ideas came about. And I think we 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 also mentioned him quite a bit about that we didn't want it we wanted it just like the movie to be very intimate and not to be super grand. So we didn't want like a full orchestra. We didn't want really we wanted minimal instruments to kind of like show that kind of loneliness and like despair, I guess, but still hope some hopefulness in there. I mean, it's, it's a crazy thing to tell a composer. It's like, it needs to be, you know, melancholy, but hopeful. And it's like, how do you interpret that? And Curtis is just a phenomenal composer that just like, honestly, I, I, I want to say that most of his, uh, most of what's in the movie is like maybe second or third or fourth drafts. Like they're, they're like, he pretty much nailed it. I think there was one or two that we had some trouble with, but for the most part, he he just sent us stuff, and we were just like, oh, this is We also had another friend, uh, Dutch Rawl, who sort of handled yeah. all the synth, the synth stuff that was in the film, because uh, I think you know it's 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 a it's a it's it's a small film, and we weren't in a position of licensing like very specific '80s tracks for the yeah. movies. So we kind of had him. Take care I mean, of his, yeah, Dutch is very um, his kind of uh, bread and butter is kind of that. 80s dancey pop kind of stuff and so what he was able to bring to that was just you know it was, it was nice to have something different because you know on a low budget typically we would have had you know curtis do all of it but when we yeah. had an opportunity to work with another friend that actually specialized and and is that's his wheelhouse um it was great to have that kind of counterbalance and it just feels packaged differently in a perfect mm -hmm. way the music is wonderful it's really subtle but it's there threaded throughout the film, it really uh, makes itself known whilst honoring the story that you're all telling as well. So thank you for the question, James. Uh, I have one more from Alexandra on YouTube. Did you, the three of you take any souvenirs from the film when you finished filming it back in the day? Was anything swiped off set, I think is what Alexandra wants to know. I don't think I swipe anything. Corey, did you get, was there anything that you liked that you took from wardrobe or? 
<laughs> I don't think I took any clothes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a vintage wow. cassette to be sold on eBay or something. Actually, I don't even know where that cassette is. Did we? Did, did you end up with that, Yen? I don't know. I think it's still with probably with our production designer, Brittany, oh, okay. more than likely. Yeah, that, that might be worth some money now, Yen. <laughs> that down. Um, uh, you know, actually, it, it, real quick to bring that back when you were mentioning the voiceover thing, I, I will say that, you know, it's so powerful in the movie, but I, I have very vivid, I have a terrible memory, but I have a very vivid recollection of when we recorded that because it was, we did it in Corey's hotel room after shooting one night. And so we, we already had like a 12 hour shooting day. And, you know, begged Corey if he could do this. And we had our, our sound guy, uh, Cody. And I, I remember Corey was sitting in a chair at a desk and they had the mic and everything. And then Yen and I were literally laying on the ground, not facing him, staring up at the ceiling. And we had headphones on. And I, I want to say what ended up in the movie was like take three or take four. And we just both like there was a moment where we both looked at each other when it was like, wow, that's it. Like that's that's what we were going for, and it was just I just it, it was a uh, probably one of the most more beautiful moments on set, even though it was like after hours and it was just really stripped down. But it was just you know we just weren't looking at Corey, weren't think looking on set, just focusing on on the audio. And man, it was it, it's a real gut punch even yeah. even then. It's interesting you say it came at the end of a long day because there's such intimacy to that recording. It really comes across. Um, I had a question. I'm sorry, I don't have the name anymore because it's disappeared, but there was a question. Um, again, in regards to uh, the young brother, somebody was asking, I'm sorry, I don't have the name anymore. Um, how did you navigate working with such a young actor dealing with quite sensitive themes? I assume they mean, for example, things like AIDS and this young character's sexuality as well. What was that like working with a young actor to bring that to life? I mean, a Aiden, Aiden was one of those kids that I don't want to say we treated him like an adult because he wasn't an adult, but I think he was very mature, you know? And so, I mean, I think, I think he, he kind of had a good understanding of w w what was the premise and what was the, what was the history, you know? And so, so in a way it was, it was, it was not, not hard, you know? And I think his parents were also very open and they were not like, you know, people that we had to run things by, you know, to convey it to to Aiden, you know, so I think I think in that sense, it was like very sort of effortless. Yeah, I mean, they, they all understood the script and and, you know, I, I had actually worked with Aiden a few years before on a, on a kids movie. So I, I had actually had experience with him um and I, I didn't even know he was showing up for the auditions until he showed up and i was like i looked at him, i was like i've actually worked with this guy before and he, he he did a really good audition but yeah he, he was super professional and yeah i mean there we could we could have serious conversations with him it wasn't like we were like doing anything in metaphor or like anything like that we just we were his his mom was like just be honest with him that's the biggest key is just be honest and tell him what it is that you're looking for I do have this uh, random memory, and I don't know if you can confirm it, Corey, but I, I feel like what was transpiring in the film was also happening between you and Aiden in real life. And when we were shooting that scene in a record store, didn't you buy him a vinyl of the Dua Lipa album? I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a tech scout. I don't think that was uh, actually... Was it? I, I think we just no. took him to the location on our day off. And showed him. Yeah, we all like certain <laughs> music, but that was that was a really sweet moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it was. I, I really did feel sort of like responsible for him. <laughs> as an older I brother, introducing to divas is a very important role for an older yeah. um, figure. Thank you, and thank you for that question. I'm sorry, I don't have your name. It disappeared from here, but it was a great question. Thank you for sending it in. I've got um, a comments a comment slash question for you corey from kate i think this is somebody who knows you it says dude i miss your face when are you coming to comic con in europe again <laughs> Do you know kate? look alexis thank you for asking this question hi kate hi alexandra and uh and company and i say company there's i have i have um some i have some fans uh from really from uh gotham world um who are the most loyal enthusiastic wonderful group of people who are so supportive and i mean 
more present in my life than my parents. Not that my parents don't love me, but I mean, you know, truly yeah. more present than my life. My parents. Um, certainly with career stuff. Uh, and so they're here because they're uh, unbelievable. And um, so these are the people that are saying, hey, dude, I miss you. And I would see them occasionally because I, I would maybe like once or twice a year do Comic Cons while I was doing um, Gotham. Well, you've officially been requested to come to Europe, Corey, so. Okay. I love Europe. Well, that was, was living in France for the first six months this year, uh, working, would happily go back, you know? <laughs> I think Tate would welcome you with open arms. Um, I think so. Yen and Hutch, what's next for you? What are you working on next? Um, I don't know. It's It's been, I, I, think, I think the past few years have been really challenging, just in terms of wanting to sort of like, go back to making something again and i think i think on for indie films in general it has been even tougher you know to just sort of get going again um so i guess my answer to that question is that it remains a question mark <laughs> i will say that that like we both are staying busy but yeah the, the uh, pandemic has been kind of a nightmare but yeah. i mean you know Yen and I have did complete a new script on something else on a different project that is just kind of like in limbo. But um, yeah, we are staying busy. We're not we're not disappearing out of out of the film world. It's just you know, yeah. pandemic it, pandemic has been a nightmare. Yeah, right. the reality for artists is lots of question marks, as you mentioned, and we're all navigating it. Corey, where can we see you next? What's upcoming for you or currently? Um, I had a I had a couple movies that uh, were released in October. One was a film called Call Jane by Phyllis Nagy, uh with Elizabeth Banks and Sigourney Weaver that looks at uh, abortion in 1968 in America, which became uh, far more relevant than we intended it to uh, when we made it. And um, and a Peter Hedges film that we made during the pandemic called The Same Storm. Um, and then I, I just shot a film with Todd Haynes. It's my third film with Todd Haynes, which is amazing. Uh, it's called May, December um, with Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman and uh, some other wonderful people. And then I, I had a, um, I was shooting a limited series with Anna Winger who made Unorthodox <clears throat> for Netflix. And it's an, uh, her next project called Transatlantic uh, that deals with real characters and a real story um, about the refugee crisis in Marseille in the early years of World War II, 1940, 1941. Um, it follows this man named Varian Fry and the Emergency Rescue Committee and some of the artists and writers and um, philosophers that they saved uh, and brought to America. And that should be out on Netflix in like April, May, I think. Amazing. So lots of exciting projects. Phyllis Naj, an amazing playwright. I know you were in Carol as well. And Todd yeah. exciting projects. But this is an exciting project as well, 1985. I'm so glad we got to speak about it. Um, it's a queer Christmas, an alternative queer Christmas movie, shall we call it. And I hope um, anyone who's watched it enjoyed this chat. If you haven't seen the film, you can stream the film on the Piccadillo website. Hopefully this chat has inspired you to do so. I'd really like to thank the three of you for joining. Yen, Tan, Hutch and Corey, Michael Smith. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, thanks to everyone who's watched. Thanks to all the team behind the scenes at Piccadillo who made this happen. And also thanks to the BFI for their continued support for this, the second season of the Piccadillo Sofa Club. Thanks for watching. Thanks everyone for being here. And we're going to finish with um, a trailer for Sublime, an upcoming Piccadillo release. Thank you guys, thanks for joining me. Thanks, yeah. thanks. thank you so much. Oh, oh. El tema que estabas haciendo, no lo pusiste. Cuando lo tenga más armado. ¿Me ayudas con la letra? ¿Qué pensás? En vos. ¿Tu viejo sabe para qué la estamos usando? Ni se acuerda que existe. Cuando duerme. Mando mensajes. ¿Qué tiene? Para sin darte cuenta. Papá habla también. ¿Sabes cómo te curás? Haciendo música. Tiene que hacer lo que él quiera. Claro, por eso. La guitarra hace que una parte se tensione, otra se relaje. Como lo dice ella, es una tos sexual. No, no.
Daphne's on the Nisha. No. I'm just thinking. Voy a esperarte en el mar. Qué mejor.